Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we are learning about McLaren's Proactive Chassis Control 2 and I am super excited about this video. It's a topic and a suspension that I've wanted to cover for quite some time. Uh, I just couldn't piece together all of the information that's kind of floating around out there as far as how it works. I don't think it's ever been described really well and so that's my goal for this video and the reason why I was able to accomplish this is because I had the opportunity to speak with McLaren engineers at a recent press event uh, and learn about the suspension used in the McLaren 720S. And so many of you, I can feel it already, are going to be saying, hey man, this suspension was already used in the 1950s in the Citroen DS. And that's not all that inaccurate of a statement to say. There was a similar style suspension used uh, by Citroen back in the 1950s. However, as I'm sure you can appreciate, technology changes and evolves over time. Another fun fact, Tenneco, the original supplier for McLaren's proactive chassis control, uh, also supplied a similar suspension to Citroen for their WRC car uh, and it was actually banned by the FIA for being such an effective suspension. Uh, so very cool suspension setup and in this video we're going to cover you know what are the actual components of the setup and then in all kinds of different scenarios we're going to go through four different scenarios. How does this suspension react and why is that advantageous? All right, so first let's get a general idea of all of the components involved to understand how the system works, looking at just one axle, and then we will apply what we have learned to the entire car and look at how both the front and the rear axle are connected. So here on the left, what we have, here's our basic setup. So you've got your two wheels right here. They're connected to these lower control arms. Then you have your damper. And so this is just like your shock absorber in any other car, except instead of it, uh, you know, being an individual component, it's actually linked to the other shock absorber. So both dampers have these pistons within this cylinder and then there is a fluid and that fluid and piston can move up and down and that fluid then transfers to other locations. So you've got this tubing which routes the fluid from the bottom side of this damper to the top side of this damper and vice versa on this side. And then you have these accumulators. So these accumulators are little spheres and that oil is allowed to flow within that accumulator and then there's a flexible membrane that can actually move up and down and above that flexible membrane is a gas. So gas of course can be compressed, a liquid cannot. So what this reservoir does is it allows for that fluid to go somewhere. If the pressure is too high, it can push up on that membrane. That membrane is providing a resistance, a pressure to the overall system. So let's walk through a very simple scenario to understand why it's advantageous to link these two. Essentially what you're doing is you're eliminating uh, an anti-roll bar and you're instead using a link between your two dampers in order to achieve that. So let's say the car is taking a hard left hand turn. So the car is going to want to lean on this right side, which means this right wheel is going to want to be forced up. So the body of the car wants to roll down, the wheel kind of coming up here. And so in doing so, this piston is going to press this fluid right here, apply a high pressure to that fluid, which is going to force it to travel over to the other side. Now the other side is actually trying to extend right there uh, because the car wants to roll this way, but you're instead pushing this piston up, which means you're pushing that wheel back up to the body of the car. So instead of the car actually rolling, because you force that pressure back on the underside of this piston over here, you keep the car flat as it goes around that corner. Now a critically important component of this suspension are these flow restrictors, which you'll notice are at the exits of each of these pipings here, uh, which travel across. So these flow restrictors are changing the rate at which you allow fluid to exit from here to enter this other section. So changing the rate at which you allow fluid to either enter other cylinders or to accumulate within this accumulator. And so by changing that rate, you're changing the stiffness of the suspension. So if you have a very restricted flow restrictor Restrictor, then you're going to have a stiffer setup versus if you allow for easy flow between these cylinders then you're going to have a softer setup and you do this using a needle valve so McLaren will change the position of this needle valve so we're looking at kind of a zoomed in uh, look on one of these flow restrictors Here's our setup right here. We've got our cylinder, our damper, and you know, regular old coil spring uh, attached to the lower control arm there. 
looking just at this needle valve, you can see that you can pull this valve in or out, so you will control this depending on what mode you're in, normal, sport, or track, uh, will change where this needle valve is. So you can see that, you know, if the fluid wants to come out, it has to pass through this needle valve to exit into this piping here. And so if you force that needle valve closer, you restrict the amount of fluid flow, and if you pull that needle valve back, you allow for much easier fluid flow. So that's going to be their differentiator between normal, sport, and track. So for track mode, you know, they're going to have a lot of restriction. This needle valve is going to be moved very close. Uh, and then for normal mode, you're going to have not as much restriction, allow for easy fluid flow, and a much more comfortable ride. All right, so now let's apply what we've learned here to the entire car as a whole. And so we're going to walk through four different scenarios, starting with roll. Roll being the easiest one to understand because we've basically already explained how it works. Now we're just simply going to apply it to the entire car. And so looking at this kind of graphic here, uh, what you need to understand is that red is high pressure, blue is low pressure. And so as this car is taking a hard left-hand turn, similar to what we've got going on right over here, the car is taking that hard left-hand turn, these wheels, purple being uh, where the wheel wants to go, the wheel wants to go up because your car is leaning over so that wheel and car are coming to closer together. So that means this piston is pressing up as we saw over here. And in doing so, it's gonna create a high pressure in that upper portion of the cylinder. So that red high pressure flows out. You can see they're connected here, the front to back. Uh, and then the low pressure side are also connected here. And so that high pressure moves out. It of course moves within your accumulator and you have that membrane resisting that high pressure. Uh, but it of course is flowing that fluid within that accumulator. And then you also have it traveling over to the other two cylinders and helping to force that piston up, keeping the body flat as you go around that corner very hard. So really when looking at this roll example, it's not really any different than looking at each axle independently. There's not really a need in this scenario for the front and rear to be linked. Uh, but the other scenarios will explain why that is the case. Now our second scenario is warp, and this really shows the advantages of McLaren's system versus a traditional anti-roll bar. And so warp is when the front axle is experiencing roll in the opposite direction of the rear axle. So let's say the front axle wants to lean like this, the rear axle wants to tilt like that. That is warp, and so this is a common occurrence when you're driving over you know, regular roads that have different surface irregularities, and both of those axles have to adapt to that road and make sure the wheels maintain contact. So ideally you want a low stiffness in the system for warp, but you want a high stiffness in the system for roll. You don't want a lot of body roll, but you want to be able to allow those uh, wheels to maintain contact with the ground in warp scenarios. And so with traditional roll bars, uh, the stiffness remains the same whether it's warp or it's roll. So a traditional roll bar, let's say this is occurring, what's well, gonna try and flatten that? And in doing so, it means you're trying, you're minimizing grip that some of those wheels will have because you're trying to pull them away from the ground rather than allow them to maintain contact with the ground. So that's the disadvantage of anti-roll bars, traditional anti-roll bars, is that you have to choose a stiffness that allows for warp uh, but minimizes roll. And McLaren's system here actually allows you to have independent control of each. So in a warp scenario, as you can see, the pressure has somewhere to go. So let's say this piston wants to move up, your wheel wants to push up here, so you've got high pressure. Your wheel wants to move down on this side, so you've got high pressure. Now traditionally those are colliding, but they have somewhere to go because the opposite uh, axle is experiencing the opposite effect. So because this now has a low pressure area on this region, you allow that high pressure to travel down into the rear axle's low pressure region, and you take the rear axle's high pressure region, and you allow that to flow to the front axle's low pressure region. And so in doing so, you allow for a very low stiffness within the system under warp conditions, meaning you allow those wheels to remain completely compliant with the road. Uh, you get good contact with the road and it feels better to the driver. It doesn't feel like the car is kind of unsettled, too stiff. Instead, it remains compliant with the road and you maintain traction. All right, so our third scenario is heave. And so heave is when the entire car is experiencing the same thing. So you're going over road undulations and all four wheels either want to compress in or extend out. So let's say you're coming down a hill really 
fast, and then you start to go up a hill, then of course that car wants to press down into the ground. All of those pistons are going to want to move up together. And in this scenario, you have a very low stiffness, and that's because you're allowing that fluid to flow directly to the other side. So if you look here uh, at these four pistons, all of them wanting to move up because the car is kind of slamming down into the ground, well, it allows that high pressure to move directly over to the low pressure side of those pistons. And so, of course, in that scenario, it's, it's basically kind of free flowing. The only restriction will, of course, be these flow restrictors. So the rate at which you allow that fluid to travel over, you can change based on what mode you're in. But ultimately, you're allowing for that movement. You're allowing for the core uh, to remain compliant. So it's going to give you that comfort aspect of driving uh, as you move over, you know, different undulations on a road. Now, what if we were to change this scenario so that the rear wheels were doing something different from the front wheel? So this is dive or squat. So if you're accelerating really hard, the car is going to want to lean back, uh, squat. Or if you were to slam on the brakes, then the car is going to want to pitch forward or dive. And so that's what we have going on in this scenario. Front of the car is being compressed in. Rear of the car is extending out. And so just like in heave, you're actually allowing for this motion to occur. So there's a, a low resistance distance to this occurring, a low stiffness, and as a result, you have greater wheel articulation. And so, you know, as you can see, once again, high pressure area just travels right over to a low pressure area. It has access to low pressure areas that it can travel to. And then here, where that wheel wants to move away from the core, so pushing down, that high pressure area once again has a low pressure area to travel to. So you're allowing for that movement, you're allowing for that articulation. Now, of course, if you're, you know, driving around on a track, you don't want the car bouncing forward and back like that every time you're accelerating braking. And so you can minimize this by changing this needle valve. Uh, so for that track mode, you increase the resistance to allow that fluid flow to occur, and thus you minimize how much dive or squat the vehicle actually has. Okay, so now the overall question, you know, why create a system like this? Surely it could be more cost effective uh, and less complicated to just have a more traditional suspension setup. Uh, but when you're McLaren, you know, you're, you're trying to achieve something different. Cost and complexity aren't necessarily barriers in order to implement a technology. And so think about like, what does the customer want? They want a car that they can drive on the road that's comfortable, but they also want to be able to track it because it's a very fast, very capable car. And if you were to design a suspension for a very track capable car, it's going to look quite different, much stiffer, much less road compliant than if you were to design it for a road going car. And so by implementing a system like this, what they're doing is by changing those different modes, they're giving you a genuine difference in how this suspension is actually going to feel, uh, you know, just driving around out on the road versus switching it over to track mode and driving this car on the track where it's very independently focused and it doesn't compromise the other scenario scenario with, you know, just using a single simple suspension setup. So yes, it's a little bit more complicated than a lot of what you see out there, but in doing so, it allows McLaren to really have the best of both worlds, which is very cool between comfort and, you know, the track orientation, uh, the ability to focus purely on performance. So it's a very neat setup. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Thank you all so much for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave those below.